It's time to ask yourself what you believe. Welcome to the Money Collier Report. I'm Money Collier. In the book of Acts, we read the following, quote, And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed, and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them, and suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's bands were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awaking out of his sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, he drew out his sword, and would have killed himself, supposing that the prisoners had been fled. But Paul cried with a loud voice, saying, Do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Then he called for a light, and sprang in, and came trembling, and fell down before Paul and Silas, and brought them out, and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord, and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night, and washed their stripes, and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house. Here in the book of Acts, chapter 16, verses 25 through 34, we read of the conversion of the prison guard. Paul and Silas had been beaten and in prison for preaching the gospel, and that night a miraculous event shook the prison and freed Paul and Silas. The event also woke the prison guard, who sought to commit suicide based on his false assumption that his prisoners had all fled. Remember in Acts chapter 12, King Herod had the guards in the charge of holding Peter put to death when the angel of the Lord miraculously freed him from prison. See Acts chapter 12, verse 19. At any rate, like a samurai who had failed to perform the task his master had given him, the prison guard sought to end his own life in an attempt to show he had a bit of honor or maybe pride left. When Paul saw the prison guard was about to kill himself, Paul commanded the guard not to harm himself. This is important, for in this part of Scripture we learn that God's moral law forbids us from harming ourselves, especially when things don't go the way we want them to. This is just one place in the Bible where self-harm and suicide are condemned, and biblical Christianity is separated from pagan ideology. Now notice how the law worked fear and trembling in the prison guard. This is what the law does. It causes us to tremble before God. The Bible says the guard, quote, called for a light sprang in and came trembling and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? End quote. Acts 16, verse 30. To this the command was given, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice that this command points us to the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's one of the functions of the law to bring us to Jesus. The Bible says, quote, The law was our schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ that we might be justified by faith." Quote. Galatians chapter 3 verse 24 After pointing the prison guard to the gospel, notice that the gospel was explained. The Bible says, quote, "...and they spake unto him the word of the Lord." End quote. Acts chapter 16 verse 32 The gospel is a report. It is comprised of indicative statements which God's people believe. The Bible says, quote, 
Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? In quote, Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1. Before one believes the good news, one needs to know what that good news is. The Bible says, quote, How shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? In quote, Romans chapter 10, verse 14. We must explain to contrite sinners who Jesus is and what he did for us about 2,000 years ago. When we explain the gospel, then we are teaching the doctrine of justification by faith alone. Sola fide, as it is sometimes called, is the Articulus Stantus et Cadentis Ecclesiae, which is Latin and means that justification by faith alone is the article by which the church stands or falls. Now notice the result of the gospel upon the mind of this elect sinner. The Bible says, quote, And he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them, and rejoiced, believing in God. End quote. Acts 16, verse 34. The gospel grants God's elect faith, causing them to believe, for it is efficacious, it is powerful. The Bible says, quote, Thy word hath quickened me. End quote. Psalm 119, verse 50. Again we read, quote, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. End quote. Romans chapter 10, verse 17. The gospel of Jesus Christ is, quote, The power of God and the salvation to everyone that believeth. End quote. Romans chapter 1. Of course, that was verse 16. However, God has determined for reprobates never to believe the gospel. The Word of God was never intended to save reprobates, but the Bible hardens them. The Bible says, quote, Also I heard the voice of the Lord, saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. And he said, Go, and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant, and the houses without man, and the land be utterly desolate, and the Lord have removed men far away, and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. End quote. Isaiah chapter 6, verses 8 through 10. Martin Luther, speaking of how God's word hardened Pharaoh, wrote the following, and I quote, Moreover, God was equally certain that the will of Pharaoh, being naturally evil and averse, could not consent to the word and work of God, which was contrary to it, and that, therefore, while the impetus of willing was preserved in Pharaoh by the omnipotence of God, while the hated word and work was continually set before his eyes without, nothing else could take place in Pharaoh but offense and the hardening of his heart. End quote. Bondage of the Will, section 90. So let's now return to Acts chapter 16 and the conversion of the prison guard. I hope you see that the miraculous event that shook the prison and freed Paul and Silas from their bonds was not intended for them to escape into the darkness, but it was all a determined it was all determined by God, who worketh all in all, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 6, to bring one of his elect to faith in Christ. I hope you also see the law gospel distinction found in this remarkable passage of Scripture. Notice how the law was applied first to the prison guard, then after he became contrite, the gospel was applied. Do you see how the law kills and terrifies? It causes us to tremble while the gospel quickens and causes us to believe and to rejoice. Truly, the good news that Jesus Christ came as our surety, has borne all of our sins, carried our sorrows, lived a perfect life in our place, died on the cross as our substitute, completely paying our sin debt, satisfying God's law for us, pardoning all of our sins, not imputing our sins unto us, but granting us His perfect imputed righteousness, entitling the life eternal, Surely all of this is worth rejoicing over. I think it is. God bless. Dr. Luther. Yes,
yesterday you admitted these writings were yours. Will you tell us now? Do you persist in what you have written here? Or are you prepared to retract these writings and the beliefs they contain? I ask pardon if I lack the manners that befit this court. I was not brought up in king's palaces, but in the seclusion of a cloister. I am asked to retract these writings, but they are of different kinds. In some I discuss faith and good works. If I were to retract these, I should be denying accepted Christian truths. In others, I attack popery and assail men who have afflicted the Christian world and ruined the bodies and souls of other men. If I were to retract those, I should be like a cloak that covers evil. Most serene emperor, illustrious princes, noble lords, I am only a man and not God. But I must defend myself as did Jesus Christ when he said, as I say now, if I have spoken evil, bear witness against me. Martin Luther, you have not yet answered the question. Give us a simple answer. Will you recant or will you not? You ask for a simple answer. Here it is. Unless you can convince me by scripture and not by popes or councils who have often contradicted each other, unless I am so convinced that I am wrong, I am bound to my beliefs by the texts of the Bible. My conscience is captive to the word of God. To go against conscience is neither right nor save. Therefore, I cannot and I will not recant. Here I stand. I can do no other. God help me. Amen. A standard teaching within the conservative branch of the Protestant Reformation is that our good works are necessary but not necessary for our salvation. Let me say that again. The correct biblical position is that our good works are necessary but they are not necessary for our salvation. Papists and heretics love to teach that our good works are necessary for our salvation. For they desire to teach justification by faith and works, the free will of all men, synergism, and their own evil traditions. In his lectures on the book of Galatians, commenting on Galatians chapter 1 verse 7, Martin Luther correctly writes the following, and I quote, Once more Paul makes excuses for the Galatians and bitterly attacks the false apostles. It is as though he were saying, you Galatians have been persuaded that the gospel which you receive from me is not the true and genuine gospel. Therefore you suppose that you are doing the right thing when you accept that new gospel which the false apostles are teaching and which seems better than mine. I am not accusing you so much as I am accusing those troublemakers who are disturbing your consciences and snatching you out of my hand. Here you see again how ardently and vehemently the Apostle attacks the seducers, and with what harsh words he describes them. He calls them troublers of the churches and of consciences, who do nothing but seduce and deceive an endless number of consciences and cause horrible damage and trouble in the churches. In our own day, too, we are obliged to witness this great evil, much to our sorrow, but we cannot do anything more to remedy it than Paul could in his day. This passage shows that the false apostles undoubtedly called Paul an imperfect apostle and a weak and erring preacher. For this reason he himself in turn calls them troublers of the churches and subverters of the gospel of Christ. 
Thus they condemned one another. The false apostles condemned Paul, and Paul in turn condemned them. There is always such controversy and condemnation going on in the church, especially when the doctrine of the gospel is prospering. The wicked teachers persecute, condemn, and oppress the faithful teachers, who in turn attack and condemn them. Today the papists and the sectarians hate us violently and condemn us, and we in turn detest and condemn their impious and blasphemous doctrine with great hatred. Meanwhile, the poor common people are confused. They waver back and forth, wondering and doubting which side to take or whom it is safe to follow. For it is not given to everyone to make Christian judgments about such important issues. The outcome will show which side was right in his teaching and in his condemnation of the other. It is certain that we do not persecute, oppress, or kill anyone, nor does our doctrine trouble consciences, but it delivers them from the endless errors and traps of the devil. In support of this claim, we have the testimony of many good men who thank God that our doctrine has given a sure comfort to their consciences. Just as Paul, therefore, was not at fault when the churches were troubled, but the false apostles were, so in our day it is not our fault, but that of the Anabaptists, Sacramentarians, and other fanatics that so many great troubles have arisen in the church. Note carefully here that everyone who teaches works and the righteousness of the law troubles the church and consciences. Who would believe that the Pope, cardinals, bishops, monks, and that whole synagogue of Satan, see Revelations 2, 9, especially the founders of the holy orders, some of whom God could miraculously save, were troublers of consciences. In fact, they are much worse than those false apostles. The false apostles taught that in addition to faith in Christ, the works of the law of God were also necessary for salvation. But our opponents skipped faith altogether and taught human traditions and works not commanded by God, but invented by them without and against the word of God. These they have not only put on par with the word of God, but have raised far above it. But the holier the heretics seem to be in external appearance, the more damage they cause. For if the false apostles had not possessed outstanding gifts, great authority, and the appearance of holiness, and if they had not claimed to be the ministers of Christ, pupils of the apostles, and sincere preachers of the gospel, they could not so easily have undermined the authority of Paul and made an impression on the Galatians. The reason Paul takes such a strong stand against them and caused them troublers of the churches is that they taught that in addition to faith in Christ, circumcision, and the observance of the law, were necessary to salvation. Paul testifies to this later on in the fifth chapter, and in Acts chapter 15 verse 1, Luke says the same thing. Some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. End quote. Luther's Works, volume 26, that was from pages 51 through 53. As you can see, it is heresy to teach that our good works are necessary to salvation. Those who teach that our good works are necessary to salvation are teaching justification by faith and works. This heretical notion, this notion that our good works are necessary to salvation, received confessional condemnation in the formula of Concord during the Protestant Reformation. The Bible-believing Lutherans, Presbyterians, and particular Baptists have always rejected the notion that our good works are necessary for our salvation. Calvinist and Presbyterian Gordon H. Clark, in his excellent commentary on the book of Philippians, rejected the notion that our good works are necessary to salvation when he correctly wrote the following, and I quote, Note that the Judaizers believed in Christ as Messiah. Presumably they believed in the virgin birth. They acknowledged that Christ wrought miracles, that his death was a sacrifice, and that he rose from the dead. Yet Paul denounced them in the harshest terms. Why? The answer is perfectly clear. They believed that something further was necessary, but they did not believe that his death was sufficient. End quote. Philippians page 85. Gordon Clark, like Martin Luther, understood that those individuals who teach that our good works are necessary for our salvation are denying the sufficiency of the death of Christ. They are rejecting it. If you teach that our good works are necessary to salvation, then you are saying 
that what Christ did for us is not enough. You have to do good works. Biblical Christianity teaches that our good works are necessary, but not for our salvation. They are necessary for glorifying God and helping our fellow man. Brace yourselves, amigos. Gentlemen, we're history. What's that you say? You say you're tired of the evil perpetuated by the United States government? You say you're tired of the illegal, offensive wars based on lies? You say you're tired of watching the Bill of Rights disintegrate in the name of security? What's that? You say you're tired of corrupt politicians who wouldn't resign if they were caught eating small children? You say you're tired of police brutality, government surveillance, and you think that we may be becoming an Orwellian police state? Is that what you're saying? What's that? You, what's that you say? You say you think the answer to 1984 is 1776? Is that what you think? The answer to 1984 is not 1776. If you're going to answer with a date, then at least get the date right. The answer to 1984 is 1517. The answer to 1984 is 1688. The answer to 1984 is the 1730s. You see, during the Dark Ages, Europe was controlled by one of the most evil police states the world has ever seen the Roman Catholic Church, headed up by the Pope, who is Antichrist, headquartered at the Vatican. Now on October 31, 1517, Martin Luther nailed up the 95 Theses to the church doors of Wittenberg's Castle Church. Thus began the Protestant Reformation, where large numbers of people throughout Europe left the evil of Roman Catholicism and were converted to Biblical Christianity. They were converted by the preaching of Sola Scriptura, the Bible alone is the Word of God, and Sola Fide, justification by faith alone. A couple of ideas you people probably haven't even heard of. <laughs> well, maybe. The results of this preaching of justification by faith alone 
led to national sovereignty and civil liberties. In the 17th century, in England, Roman Catholic King James II was closing his grip on Great Britain. He had placed Roman Catholics in key political and military positions. He had put an end to the people's right to free speech, a free press, and the right to bear arms. In a last-minute attempt to stop Great Britain from becoming a police state, in a last-minute attempt to prevent Great Britain from slipping back into the Dark Ages, the people invited William of Orange, a Calvinist, to cross the English Channel and to rule jointly with Queen Mary. He did, and Calvinism swept across to England, vanquishing Roman Catholic King James II to France and reestablishing freedom of speech, freedom of the press, the right to bear arms, and many other civil liberties. When our own war for independence would be fought, Samuel Adams, the father of the American Revolution and also a staunch Calvinist, modeled the American war for independence on this British Revolution which is known as the Glorious Revolution of 1688. You still think 1776 is the answer to 1984? Huh. 1776 is the result of the 1730s, the period known as the First Great Awakening. Leading up to this time period, the English-speaking people of North America had become confused under a storm of Calvinistic preaching, however, the preaching of justification by faith alone, the colonies went through a spiritual awakening where they were turned back to biblical Christianity. As usual, when large numbers of people in a land are converted to biblical Christianity, one of the results is biblical political thought. The people come to embrace a limited government, a representative government based on elders, that is, elected officials from their own congregation. Just as the church is based on a written text, the Bible, so the biblical political thought results in the government being based on a written text, the Constitution. See the resemblance? You won't hear any of this from Ron Paul or Alex Jones, for they either do not know this information, or they simply do not care. Ron Paul and Alex Jones, what a joke. This nation has become the land of Sodom. And foolish people want to put their trust in Ron Paul and Alex Jones? Are you crazy? Electing Ron Paul as president would stop the destruction of the United States about as much as a single man using a small bucket to bail water out of the Titanic. Today's evil government is a simple reflection of our entire evil society. Until the people of this nation hear the moral law of God, and become contrite for their sins until the people of this nation hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and come to believe in justification by faith alone then don't expect any change for unless God changes the mind of evil sinners gives them repentance causes them to believe the gospel of Jesus Christ then those evil sinners will be destroyed speaking of a nation that once believed the teachings of the Bible, a nation that once believed the gospel, but has since seen an evil generation arise that knows not the God of the Bible. Speaking of such a people, the Bible says the following, and I quote, For their vine is of the vine of Sodom, and of their fields of Gomorrah. Their grapes are grapes of gall, their clusters are bitter. Their wine is the poison of dragons and the cruel venom of asps. Is not this laid up in store with me and sealed up among my treasures? To me belongeth vengeance and recompense. Their foot shall slide in due time. For the day of their calamity is at hand, and the things that shall come upon them make haste. For the Lord shall judge his people and repent himself for his servants when he seeth their power is gone, and there is none shut up or left. And he shall say, Where are their gods, their rock, in whom they trusted, which did eat the fat of their sacrifices, and drink the wine of their drink offerings? Let them rise up and help you be your protection. See now that I, even I, am he. There is no God with me. I kill, and I make alive. A wound, and I heal. 
is there any that can deliver out of my hand? Or I lift up my hand to heaven and say I'll live forever. If I whip my glittering sword in my hand, take hold on judgment, I will render vengeance to mine enemies and will reward them that hate me. I will make mine arrows drunk with the blood, and my sword shall devour flesh, that with the blood of the slain and of the captives from the beginning vengeance upon the enemy. Leviticus chapter 32, starting at verse 32, ending at verse 42. That's what's in store for this nation. God's going to destroy this wicked nation unless large numbers of people come to believe the gospel. If that doesn't happen, well then the few that are here, the remnant they will simply be pushed aside. Like Jeremiah was tossed down a well, while the city above him was utterly destroyed. Like Lot was removed from Sodom, and Sodom was utterly destroyed. If there is no spiritual awakening in this nation, then this nation will be destroyed. For this is a nation of great sinners. The blood of millions are upon the hands of this nation. This nation must come under the conviction of God's moral law. It must cry out, and it must turn and believe the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. The sinners of this nation, their only hope is if they come to believe that Jesus Christ lived a perfect life in their place, died on the cross in their stead, propitiating God's wrath, expiating their sins, they're going to have to believe that Jesus Christ and Him alone satisfied the law of God for them. They're going to have to believe that the righteousness of Jesus Christ was imputed to their account. They're going to have to believe this gospel. They're going to have to receive this gospel by faith alone. And if they don't, 